see that? So I'll just give you a moment. I want to congratulate now Senator Janine Solomon, who was Representative Janine Solomon, but recently appointed to Senate District 15. And she let me know that she's going to be sworn in on Friday. So congratulations, Janine. So while you're looking at our esteemed list of senators and representatives, um, here's how I'm going to propose we have our conversation. I, I wanted to invite our legislators, and I notice I misspelled that in the heading here. I'm usually better at uh, my copywriting. Um, I wanted to invite our legislators to speak to us about the upcoming session. And in particular, um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Washington County Thrives, we have three long-standing priorities, and those are affordable housing and wraparound services, early learning and youth enrichment, and workforce training. So we were hoping to get some insights as to whether or not there are legislative proposals, funding, or policy uh, that are coming up in this short session that may impact those priorities. Now, beyond those three, there are other, of course, important issues. And I do, I will um, encourage our legislators to, to speak to some of these other issues if there is time for us to do that. Um, what I want to do is rather than kind of have a panel speaker approach, I'd like our legislators to kind of chime in as they're willing. I'm gonna ask a couple of you to kick this off and I'm gonna suggest that if we have Representative Helm and Representative McLean, who are, if my research is correct, our most seasoned state legislators, I'm going to invite them to kick it off. And then we'll just allow the representatives and senators to chime in as they wish on these issues and make this a conversation. Um, and keeping your comments lean, if you will, so that there's room for everyone to speak, because we do have limited time, and hopefully having opportunities for our other attendees in this gathering to share some comments or ask some questions after the legislators have had a chance to give some opening remarks and perspective on these issues. Does that sound like a reasonable approach? Are we good with that? Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs up here. So, shall Representative McLean, shall I ask you to kick off with some comments? Welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. I uh, may I put my hand down now? You certainly may. <laughs> it just looks so awkward up there. <laughs> I'll put that down. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting all of us here today. And it was so interesting to hear all of your updates and hear you talking and sharing with each other, uh, because that's certainly how we're going to get things done is making sure that we don't have gaps in our services for our communities and that we really are working together to get as much as we can from all volunteerism and for all budgets that we all are trying to put together for some very specific uh, types of endeavors and priorities. Uh, I have been at the legislature since 2015 after a 42 year teaching career. And I also am still volunteering at the Glencoe High School for speech and debate and keeping track of what it's like to be around high school students and, and what it's like to serve with high school students. And it, it's, a, it's a pleasure and I love doing it. Um, affordable housing and youth enrichment and workforce are are easy priorities for me to uh, to fall into uh, some kind of rhythm with you uh, because they are things that I have been working on uh, throughout my my tenure year here at the legislature. Affordable housing has been uh, an important element for my caucus and also for the speaker that I've served under for seven or eight years. And uh, we've worked really hard to try and bring together a very complex system that uh, includes services, schools, um, abilities to get around uh, walkable communities. I was part of the um, Metro Council when we put together the 2040 concept 
and we worked on transit oriented development and we brought together uh, many elements of transportation land use and housing uh, as we i've been watching the prices for housing uh, over the last 11 12 months uh, every single day i check housing to see where it's at to see how many houses have sold what the stock is and specifically uh, what the percentage of increase in the prices have been and it's been horrifying uh, and part of the folks uh, think that it's just because we don't have enough land and so far in my experience i've i don't find that to be the full story so i think it's extremely important as we're working forward on some rules that are coming from the environmental um, um i guess i would say spot or beginning because it came from the governor's executive order on uh, environmental issues and we have three to five agencies statewide that are working on it it's not always a bill that gets work done uh, we also have agencies, we have rulemaking, and we have connections with our partners at the counties and the cities and metro, and also with our nonprofits. So affordable housing, uh, there are folks in our, we only have one or two bills. Uh, I'm trying to set a model of only having one uh, this short session. It's only 35 days. And it's really difficult to have full policy conversation in 35 days. You have to have your work done before the session starts. And some of us have been working the entire um, interim and still have some conversations to be had. So we'll be bringing some of those bills in 2023. My personal bill is uh, on newborn testing protocols. Uh, I want to make sure that the babies that are born in the state of Oregon and use our newborn testing lab have the protocols to help them make sure that if they do have a genetic disease or problems, that they have an opportunity to be tested so they have also the opportunity to be treated. Some of these diseases and treatments have to be done in the first 30 days to be able to have any kind of impact. So that's my one personal bill and will be my high priority as a personal bill. Um, I am also the co-chair of the um, work of basically education uh, subcommittee on budget and workforce is not just coming out of the governor's office with a large package, but it also is coming out of really the second year of a budget cycle, really looking at workforce issues, where we're doing well, where we think there are gaps, and making sure that any new workforce dollars are going to be integrated with the workforce uh, dollars that we have right now. And that's one of the areas, again, where it's not a bill that's doing the work, but it's the budget work and the budget review. So um, thank you very much for letting me have an opportunity. I don't wanna use up more than my time, but I'm more than willing to answer questions or add to this. I, I do co-chair the Joint Transportation Committee. And remember that if we want affordable housing, we have to make sure that our houses and our jobs are within either short driving distance. Uh, we, it's not a good idea to have um, our Intel folks working in in, you know, in Hillsboro or Beaverton and living in Vancouver. So uh, transportation and housing are also connected. So those are just some morning thoughts and happy to give more, uh, more direct information as questions come up. Wonderful, thank you, Representative McLean. Representative Ken Helm, would you like to share some remarks? Yes, uh, thank, thank you for inviting me this morning. Um, and, I also enjoyed uh, hearing your updates this morning and hearing all the good work that's going on um, in Washington County. Uh, like Rep. McLean, I've served in the legislature since 2015. Susan and I came, we, we were in that entering class and uh, time, time goes by very quickly all of a sudden. Uh, I like the term seasoned instead of old, <laughs> uh, but we are, our class has, is, been there a while now, and we find ourselves um, having quite a bit of institutional knowledge. And um, that is great uh, from the point of view that we can help our fellow legislators you know, hit the ground running and on their projects. I uh, represent, I have represented House District 34, which is a good chunk of North Beaverton, Cedar Hill, Cedar Mill, and West Haven neighborhoods, and, in, and a portion of Rock Creek. Um, the districts have changed, of course, and uh, the district that I used to represent um, has, has transferred into House District 27 uh, in, in a portion, 
Um, I'm planning to ask folks to reelect me to that district in the coming election. So hope to continue my service to the county. My background um, has been in land use, my professional background. And I was a land use attorney for uh, 20 plus years. Part of those years, I was Susan's attorney at Metro when we did some of the most important early urban growth boundary work in the region back in the early 2000s. And so that's what that was that that work experience has channeled me into those types of committees, um, which which happen to be um, slightly different than the focus of your work here, this this group. And that is can included environmental law, climate change, uh, addressing climate change, and most recently water. Uh, so I'm spending most of my time these days trying to get the state uh, on a trajectory that adequately plans for our water future. And if, if you've come up against water in any of its iterations, you know that the management and, and planning for it is a, is a long range exercise. So we're talking about the next 50 to 100 years. And I know that that has hit some of the folks that you serve um, in the recent past. We, during the pandemic, many folks could not pay their water bills, for example, just in the same way that they had trouble paying rent and they had trouble paying um, their utility bills. And um, our community-based organizations rushed in to help fill the void and make sure that folks had those basic necessities over the past two years. I'm really thankful for that. And it shows me um, not working in, uh, in the um, community service world, um, how important that is to us in government, because we need you for the last few steps, the last half mile to get services to our residents. Um, I, I'll just say this about our discussion today. One of the places where I have stuck my foot in your world um, very consistently in my level of support is workforce development. And that, that goes yeah. through our, uh, throughout our oh, uh, educational systems and into our community colleges. One of the most um, interesting pieces of research that I've come across lately came from uh, the Oregon Business and Industry Council study on manufacturing in Oregon. And it's, it's growing place um, in our economy. We kind of tend to think of our state as split between high tech and agriculture and, and timber. That's obviously changing. Um, the good news about manufacturing jobs is um, it takes, it does not take an extended amount of higher education to qualify folks to, to be in those jobs and they are quite good paying jobs. And the state has started to prepare itself through um, endeavors like the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center and the partnership with PCC um, to train folks to get into high-tech manufacturing. So uh, those are the types of things that I find um, a, a triple bottom line win. And all of your work feeds into that because often the times our students that come into community college, they need that extra boost from uh, a better start in life to finish up and then get out into the workforce um, and, and become uh, effective and capable citizens. So th thanks again. Um, if you have land use questions along the uh, line for the rest of the morning, I'm happy to try to help answer those. Thanks again. Thank Brianna. you, Representative Helm. Appreciate that. Um, if folks do have questions as our senators and representatives are speaking, you're more than welcome to include those in the chat and comments, of course, are welcome. So I'm going to open it up now and um, I'm going to ask our legislators if, if you want to use your emoticon to raise your hand and I can kind of cycle through that. That's a wonderful way to do it. Um, Senator Akasha, welcome. We have not met before. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, would you like to share some comments? Sure. Thank you so much, Glenn. So good morning, everyone. My name is Akasha Lawrence Spence. I'm state senator for District 18. Um, I was recently appointed in December. What is time? Um, and was formerly a state representative for District 36. Um, 
I am really happy to be here this morning and to meet you all. I'm so um, happy to be here while you were doing your announcements and to hear all that's happening in community. Um, one of the things that I always say is that we don't do this work alone as legislators. We are doing it constantly in tandem with the work that you're doing, working on arm in arm and, and lockstep with you all. So it's really important to hear the work you're doing and to make sure that we're supporting it. Um, the One of the priority bills that I have coming this session um, is the Equity Investment Act. Um, we now have a bill number um, that will be, I want to share that with you, SB 1579. Um, so the Equity Investment Act is a concept that um, my office had been working on since 2020, and there had been a large coalition that um, was created, the Equity Investment Coalition, um, to push this bill forward. It is much more trimmed down than the original concept, um, but what it does is still the same. So its, it's um, impetus is to create um, generational wealth equity in communities most harmed by over-policing, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and the criminal justice system. So that's going to be looking at our Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities and doing things to not just um, bolster their current well-being, but their futures. And so the Equity Investment Act establishes a $50 million fund in Business Oregon to provide grants to culturally responsive community-based organizations that support entrepreneurship, workforce development, and paths to home and land ownership. And so this bill is definitely completely up your alley. It is, you know, hitting the markers on making sure that um, home ownership is affordable. You know, one of the things that we constantly talk about it in affordable housing um, is, you know, how do we get people to also have affordable home ownership? Um, because in affordable housing, your rent still goes up year after year. But if you have a 30 year mortgage, that's static for 30 years, give or take a refinance, right? And so being able to have people, especially low-income people, especially people who have been um, marginalized from home ownership and the wealth building that comes from that um, is critically important for not only our the, the health of our communities, but the um, strength of our economy, right? Moving forward, we saw how um, fragile our communities are when they don't have access to wealth, right? When they don't have reserves to lean on um, during times of economic shock and downturn during this COVID-19 pandemic. So that's been really, really, um, you know, something that I've been working on and something that is um, near and dear to the work that I do in the legislature and without. Um, I also want to just take a, a quick time to um, talk about uh, some of the labor justice bills um, that I'm going to be um, championing. So essential worker pay, farm worker overtime, labor harmony, um, and other bills to really bolster our ability to um, have our economy strengthened and um, have some climate action. Um, I'm, you know, pushing forward with the Treasury Transparency Bill, the establishment of the state bank, and updating our immigrant ready and refugee welcome program by removing the term alien on um, you know, documents that people who come to this country and are seeking refuge um, have to check off and have to be called alien when they come here. Um, I'm the first person in my family born in America. And so I have a personal attachment to that and understand why that's important to have that feel feeling of welcome um, and that this is your new home. Um, and so um, like my uh, chief of staff put in the chat, uh, Rep Graber, myself and Rep Reynolds is having a town hall tonight. So you can come and hear more about those bills um, and we'd be ready and prepared to answer more questions. Um, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you all and to meet you. And um, if it's okay with you, Glenn, I'd love to choose the next person. <laughs> um, I'll popcorn it to, um, uh, Senator Lieber. Uh, thank you so much, Senator. I appreciate that. And um, I appreciate being here and uh, hearing everything that you all had to say. Um, my name's Kate Lieber. I represent Senate District 14, which is uh, currently Beaverton, Aloha, and parts of Southwest Portland. As you all know, um, we had a redistricting that happened. And so my district will actually move quite significantly, but I will still retain uh, parts of Beaverton and, and Washington and uh, the Washington County. Um, I actually serve on a, a number of committees. I'm on uh, labor and business, human services, mental health and recovery. I'm on full ways and means, which is the budget. I chair energy and environment. And I also chair the human services sub for uh, ways and means. And uh, you know that is that's a it's a lot. 
Um, but what I love about these, and actually it's so great to come to them and hear my fellow legislators talk, because we actually don't often hear what each other is doing because um, everybody's off doing their thing. And, um, you know, Senator Lawrence Spence was absolutely correct. This is a team sport, right? And we actually rely on each other's expertise in order to really inform what's happening in, this, in the legislature and really rely on community members to help us make sure that what we're doing is really a, uh, affecting uh, appropriately what's happening sort of at street level. So these are so valuable for us in so many ways. So thank you for having us. You know, I, um, I'm working on a number of different things is in this. Um, and one of the big things is uh, shepherding through the historic investments that we made in behavioral health this last session, you know, that those investments are going to take time, but if we do it right, we're actually going to be able to transform the system to actually make it a better delivery system. In addition to that, we're really using not only those investments, but investments that were made in affordable housing and investments through uh, ballot measure 110 into substance use disorder to fund what I keep calling the three-legged stool. You have to fund all three in order to really make effective change, especially for those who are facing houselessness, who are, are, are houseless uh, right now, because you can't just house somebody, you actually have to have some wraparound services in order to make sure that they're able to stay in their housing and keep housing. So one of the things is sort of to make sure that we're continually moving those kinds of investments forward in a really profound way. The other thing that is, um, and we talked about it in the last, I think some of you were in the last year, uh, session with us um, as well, but we talk a lot about workforce and there's a lot happening in the workforce space. We know that the workforce challenges that we have right now um, you know, we, we, I always say that the, the, what the pandemic has done is it sort of laid bare really things that were sort of coming. We knew we were going to have workforce challenges when, um, especially when the baby boomers started retiring, right? We just didn't know they were going to happen this quickly and with this much force. And so really it's important for us to understand that we've got immediate workforce needs but we also have to make sure that we don't take our eye off the ball on intermediate and long-term workforce needs because we'll just be back in the same churn that we are right now. So we have a lot of things that's happening within budgets to try to shore up our current workforce. I know in the human services space, we're really trying to look at giving, um, it, actually giving bonuses to people who are working in those spaces, uh, as well as there's a large um, $100 million package that looking at giving some economic relief to uh, frontline workers. That's something to try to help shore up the current workforce. There's also, we're looking at longer term issues. And one of my priority bills is uh, universal representation. And universal representation, I look for us as I look at as actually a workforce bill. That is a bill that is going to bring stability to our immigrant neighbors. Um, it's bipartisan and bicameral. We have about, um, I think right now, 36. Um, legislators who have signed on, and it provides legal defense for Oregonians facing deportation and other immigration legal issues. And we know that if you provide an attorney for someone facing deportation, they are five times more likely, five times more likely to exercise their lawful right to be here. If we can actually get people to exercise their lawful rights to be here, that creates incredible stability for our communities and helps in workforce. And so as we look towards um, shoring up workforce, that's one of these sort of ideas that we're going to look at this session, knowing that that actually bill had been, so Representative McLean, I'll let you know that bill has worked, as you know, last session, we're just bringing it back. We're not introducing something new and new and in uh, at this session in this short session. So um, there's also and others might talk about what the governor's doing in workforce ready. So there's a huge two hundred million dollar package in that. I'm going to let others go into the details of that. But thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you, Senator. All right, we've got about a half an hour left. I see four hands raised among our legislators here. I'm going to ask you to try to keep your comments to about three minutes. So if you can track your time or if you want me to track your time, I'm happy to do that. So, okay, I will do that. 
Uh, who would like to go next? Because I see S Senator Salmon. Uh, why don't you go next and then Representative Dexter? Thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity. And um, those who know me, like I'm writing notes, so I'm going to speak quick. So I want to say thank you so much. If you have these meetings regularly, I think a lot of us would really love to attend these. This is great information, especially when you're look, talking about us um, being partners in this work. Um, we can be help be key communicators to you in providing some of this information that you provided in our newsletters to get that out to other folks um, within the community. So please partner with legislators um, in getting that information out. And thank you so much. So I am Janine Salmon. I'm currently the state representative, uh, Senate designee, designee I, I don't know, I don't, Friday I get sworn in. So I'm really excited about this. But um, I have represented Banks, North Plains, Hillsboro, and Aloha Beaverton. I am adding to that Force Grove and Cornelius, which I'm very excited because I grew up in Force Grove. I, I graduated from Force Grove and grew up in Gales Creek. So this is um, this is exciting times. It is um, it is let's define exciting though. It's 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 horrifying, scary times as well. We are still in the throes of this pandemic. So I would say that as we're talking about needs and priorities, it's about the workforce, 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 and it's about recovery. I'm a mom of two teachers. I am deeply concerned about the mental health needs of our students, our staff, and our families. Um, we're seeing that outplayed in our media right now. And then what's even more frightening is the stuff that we're not hearing about in our media right now, because it is there. And, and I am very concerned about making sure that we have mental health uh, support supports and um, uh, for our fam for our students, especially our kids are, are suffering. Um, I would say that I'm um, talking about the couple of bills. I will mention, yes, supporting Washington County Preschool for, for All. That's not a bill, but that's a movement. And I think that's incredibly important and it was talked about. I also making sure that we're making, Oregon has taken strides in childcare and early education, but we have a lot to do to create a more affordable childcare um, option for working families and help the profession be more of a living wage opportunity for those seeking these, these jobs. Um, one of my bills is coming back, um, is a computer science bill. It's about um, bringing uh, standards to Oregon that um, making sure that the, our workforce and jobs of tomorrow it, our, our, the training is there for our students and it's diversifying because right now what we're seeing is in our STEM classes, science, technology, engineering, math, it's predominantly white male students that are taking those classes. We need to make sure that we're diversifying those opportunities for our students because that's going to give them opportunity for jobs in the future. So I'm excited about working on that. Um, and again, I'm just going to end with partners, partners, partners. We're all in this. We all share this we all play a role, and um, I know many of us, so many of us are really open to continuing to build on these relationships from this call and see how, how, how we can do this more often. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative, soon to be Senator Salmon. And now, Representative Dexter, please. I know you've been patiently waiting. Thank you, Glenn. And I will just first, again, reiterate what I've heard others say. This is an incredibly important and, and impactful group. I have um, met and worked with many of you and others that I've admired the work that you're doing and have seen it and the impacts in our community. So thank you. I, I do hope to join you again. Um, I'm a physician. I'm a mom. I represent House District 33, which, as um, Rep. Helm said, is going to transition enormously. I, I am really sad. I'm going to lose a lot of my Washington County, almost all of my Washington County district. So um, I feel like I've spent a lot of time getting to know so many of you, and I don't want to lose those um, relationships, and hopefully we can maintain them as, as we move forward. One, um, my bill for the session, I, like Rhett McLean, I'm going to focus on one, um, is a community information exchange bill, and, and many of you already are part of this with Connect Oregon, and, and this is really connecting our community-based organizations with healthcare and other sectors so that we can deliver services effectively. Um, my vision, which I know many of you share, is to be able to refer my struggling um, patient 
who's in the room with me at their most vulnerable time um, for the services that really will make them healthy, whether it's job training, SNAP benefits, housing, healthcare for their children, those are the things that we know impact health much more than anything that I can do with the inhaler or the prednisone that I would give them. We've got to make sure that we have a statewide infrastructure for understanding what the needs are and how quickly we're delivering on them. So a closed loop referral system is really what we're trying to build towards. So we also can track where the needs are being met well and where they're not and where we need to invest and lift up the work that you're doing to make sure you get the resources you need. So I would really love outreach and, and feedback on that. We want to make sure that this is a low barrier entry um, for our CBOs. Um, Carly Hood Ronick from Project Access, Access Now is the chair of the CIE work group that the Health Information Technology um, Oversight Committee is running to kind of move towards legislation in 2023 for this bill. So please um, help me understand how we can make this the most effective bill for all of you. Um, I just want to say affordable housing, especially I, I represent currently unincorporated Washington County, most of everything between the, the Multnomah County County line um, to Rock Creek, um, almost to Hillsboro. And, and those areas do not have affordable housing and it's some of the most diverse um, communities in our, in our state. And we don't have access to rapid transit that's feasible. Those neighborhoods were not built with um, easy transport in mind. And so we have a lot of work to do. So um, though I won't be representing that area, it's something I really, really care about deeply. So please help me understand what I can do um, from my position uh, to make sure that we all make it affordable and livable community Last thing, and I, I know that I'm almost there, Glenn, um, what Stephanie Hooper is talking about, that people need to be able to age gracefully and in place with dignity and, and not needing our skilled nursing facilities. And we, we need to figure out how to build affordable, supportive housing for our aging neighbors. And this is a critical issue and, and community is really important. So how do we do that in a way that maintains their dignity and their independence um, is not just a dignity issue. It's a healthcare issue. Like we cannot um, absorb those people and they do poorly in nursing facilities. Like we do not want people in nursing facilities. We need to keep them independent. So thank you all, thanks. Thank you so much, Representative Dexter. Representative Scouten, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Representative Scouten and I'm currently representing House District 27, South Beaverton and parts of unincorporated Southwest Portland. And um, I'm gonna to try to keep it brief because then we're running out of time. First of all, thank you folks for having these conversations. This is a great group that brings in so many people. Um, there's many subjects that have been talked about. I think housing overlays so much of it. Part of my um, giving back to the community is being on the community action board. And that's been a wonderful organization to watch how they help the whole community because if you don't have housing, you don't have much else going right in your life. So um, that's really, really important. Um, having built my legislative career on my public health career, um, I know the importance of all these different factors that, you know, infect the public health, besides housing, things like transportation, et cetera. Um, along those lines, we there's two bills that I have, like most of the other legislators, here for short session. They have to be kind of short and sweet and well-developed to get them through a short session. One of them is sort of a combo of a healthcare problem and workforce problem. And that is we have a very critical shortage of surgical techs in our state. There is only um, two places where you can train, one in Clackamas County, one Lane County, to be a surgical tech. We are now having surgeries that are being postponed or, or having to be delayed because they don't have surgical techs. This is a great career for somebody to go into. Um, it, they start between $26, $27 an hour. But right now, the only pathway is through community college. But we've worked with Bowley to get an apprenticeship model to be able to ultimately sit for the same um, licensing um, as the people go through the community college. But they will actually be able to get into these careers, earn money as they're learning, and that will open it up to a more diverse population of people who can learn these jobs. So it's, it's good on both aspects. 
Then um, the um, other bill I have is about smoking. We have a distance of 10 feet in this state that, um, that you can smoke near a public building. That's way behind the times. We put it in because we were one of the earlier adopters. But now we'd like to be as progressive as Idaho and have 25 feet barrier for um, which you can um, smoke near a public building. So that's my other bill. So I will turn it over to who's ever next. Thank you, Representative Scouton. Representative Graber, please. Thanks, thanks Glenn, and thanks as others have said, I'm so grateful for this gathering this morning. I'm uh, lucky to know many of you and work with you, but for those that don't know me, I'm Representative Dacia Graber. I represent House District 35 which is uh, Tigard and Southwest Portland. And with redistricting, I will be sadly losing Tigard, which I love Tigard. And I will be migrating northward and taking on more of West Portland and into some of East Beaverton. So I'm really looking forward to running again and representing folks there. Um, it's where I live and work. Uh, speaking of work, I am living through the workforce crisis right now, the shortage. I'm a firefighter and paramedic. Uh, we are critically short staffed. Some of our neighboring agencies are in mandatory 48s. We are nearing that. Um, my average work, average work week right now, you can tell I'm over caffeinated, is about 96 hours. So this is across the state. It's not just regionally here and we are tired, um, but onward, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna be okay. But that's a great segue. I am involved in the governor's uh, Oregon Ready Workforce Bill. I'm particularly advocating the piece around apprenticeships. It's not an immediate fix, but it's how we are going to bring more people into middle class living wage jobs. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, as far as personal bills, I have two bills in the workers' compensation space, making sure that injured workers and workers who have faced exposures like firefighters have adequate protection. And then I'm also championing some bills that I'm chief sponsoring with folks uh, in the Senate, including Senator Dembro. We have a bill uh, for those of you that are familiar with the tank farm, the CEI hub on the river. We are looking to give DEQ enforcement capability to make sure that they have a plan for those in the case of a Cascadia earthquake. So those of you that know me know I can talk for hours about emergency management and preparedness, so I won't do that today. Um, I also, uh, people mentioned the team approach um, for legislating. I don't know if any of you were soccer players. I kind of see my role in the, in the house as a midfielder. That's what I played on the field, on the turf, and it's what I'm doing right now. So I am looking forward to making some big assists and helping get some of these really worker-centered, justice-centered bills across the line, including the essential worker pay, Senator Lord Spence's equity investment bill, farm worker overtime, universal representation, and so many other bills that are really going to protect our, the most vulnerable in our community. Another segue, Carol, you asked a great question about some of the affordable housing that's phasing out. I'm gonna be championing a couple bills that will directly affect that. We're looking at a um, preservation tax credit. It's something that's been looked at before and uh, Representative Lively's bringing that forward. And then with Senator Patterson, we're looking at tenant protection vouchers and that will help those folks immediately at Woodspring, at Hawthorne Villas, to make up for that rent increase. It is not, to me, a long-term fix. It's something that's going to keep our, our seniors housed, but it is important. And then last but not least, Bob asked a great question in the chat about uh, houselessness. And everyone on here knows it is a critical issue. There is no quick and easy fix. We need to get people safely off the streets, but we need to have long-term solutions. Uh, one of the things I'm proudest about in, in the long session was working with Just Compassion of Washington County to secure ARPA dollars to, to kind of address that in Washington County where we're going to build transitional housing. They have the property. It's, it's a moving forward, I know I'm running out of time, but that will get people, it'll be transitional housing for a year to get people to a space where they can have those wraparound services of addiction services, mental health, workforce training, counseling, and then get them transitioned into more permanent housing. Again, love to talk all this, please invite us back. We'd love to, I know myself and the other legislators would love to be part of these conversations. So thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much for those comments. Now, I know we've got Representative Neron in the room. I want to give her a chance to speak if she wishes. She, I, she hasn't. Please. 
Oh, <laughs> that I didn't have my hand up. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, I, yes, but I found you. I have found you. I love um, everything my colleagues have said ahead of me, so I'll try not to uh, be redundant, but I might emphasize some of the things that I'm most passionate about. It's wonderful to be here with you all. I'm so excited about the topics that you're excited about. Um, I am Courtney Neron, House District 26. I represent Hillsborough to Wilsonville along urban growth. And, um, and I really am serving for a lot of the same reasons why that you wanna talk about today, the affordable housing, uh, workforce issues, as well as um, uh, early learning. Um, as a high school teacher and a mother, um, education was really what propelled me to uh, run for office in the first place and serve um, the needs of our youngest to rely on our care and attention um, and focus. Um, so I'm really honored to be um, a member of the education committee as the vice chair, as well as the early learning committee. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll focus on some of our child care investments that you might be interested in, because um, a lot of the things that I really want to emphasize, like what Rep. Graber just mentioned about preserving our affordable housing through those two bills, so essential, we'll be working on that as well. Uh, working on uh, educator workforce uh, solutions, for example. Um, I want to focus on childcare in terms of the fact that um, we actually don't pay market rate. We don't pay the cost of true care um, uh, in our in our childcare sector. So we have a, a bill that will elevate the 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 the, the market rate to ninety percent. So that'll support our families. It'll support our childcare providers as we calculate that differently. Um, lots of investments. So this is. Um, really important dollars because we know that child care supports and early learning uh, supports not only that child and family's future, but the, um, the, the workforce in general, as we know that parents have taken a, an especially extreme hit um, during the pandemic and that currently, uh, you know, we hear a lot of people kind of talking about emerging from the pandemic, but everybody with a child five and younger knows that that child still isn't vaccinated, that we have the Omicron boom right now. And um, they're experiencing this uh, crisis currently as a very real uh, fear and, um, and crisis to navigate. So um, investing in child care, we've got um, uh, 25 million to increase the market rate calculation as well as um, new provider startup grants. So that'll be providing tech assistance and startup costs for child care providers that are thinking of getting into um, the, the business. That'll hopefully be in the $20 million ask range um, and then we've got wage supplements for child care providers who are, um, we know that, that we haven't professionalized the wages of child care providers. Teachers are also having this conversation about how many unpaid hours we work. Um, and then um, we are still setting up our new Department of Early Learning and Care that we um, organized in the 2021 session. Very exciting. Oregon is really leading the way. And as um, as I participate in some national conversations, we have our um, Department of Early Learning and Care leadership presenting at a lot of the national organizations. So we have a lot of really innovative stuff happening at the state level in terms of streamlining and coordinating our early learning and care. Um, and then, uh, so that'll require a little bit more investment. And then we're also investing in child care infrastructure facilities. We have got to make sure that as we attract uh, and try to retain child care, that we're also making sure that the space is ready for childcare, that we have the spaces to move into. So um, really wanting to emphasize those things. Um, looking through some other notes I have here, affordable housing coming up um, as one of those things that stabilizes our communities, but also our um, education and um, school. So we have so much, um, uh, that our students are navigating right now. And we really wanna make sure that we do all those wraparound services to help the, the students um, stabilize while they're in the classroom and, and make sure that we are preserving that affordable housing and then providing new opportunities um, to build and uh, think creatively about how we can use land um, with the inventory that we do have. Um, so I'm really looking forward to short session coming up. It'll be a very uh, brief time together. We'll get as much as we can done. My hope is that we're more successful than the 2020 short session. 
and um, that we really are able to do a lot of policies that are helping our Oregonians recover and rebuild and rebound from what we're going through right now. Uh, thanks again for having us and uh, looking forward to questions. Thank you, Representative Niran. Okay, am I missing any legislators? I, d I think I've gotten you all, but, um, and I think nine out of 10 were able to attend. That is a wonderful turnout, so thank you. Really appreciate your service. Um, I, I don't envy the positions you're in, but you're there because you want to be in, and we're happy that you're, you are serving in these roles. Um, are there questions that folks have gotten? Yes, and thanks. If you want to put your contact information, I see Courtney just put her email address in, so feel free to do that. Any questions from our attendees? or any comments that you'd like to share, feel free to either raise your hand or just chime in. Senator Lawrence Spence is either very cold or she's heading out as soon as she hits the leave meeting button. <laughs> Stephanie Hooper. Thanks, Glenn. I just wanted to point out that um, it would be great for us all to get to a point where we're working on these workforce issues across um, across uh, population groups so that all the caregiving professions, whether you're caring for a child, caring for an older adult, um, that those, those investments are made across the board to make those professions really have a career path and desirable. Um, I know we have to do what we have to do in, in the time to meet immediate needs, but I would just love for us to get to a point where we're really making those professions um, attractive, well-paying jobs across the lifespan. Thank you, Stephanie. Charlene, please. Hey everyone, uh, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you all for, like, thank you to everybody. I just want to do a special shout out to Senator Lauren Spence, um, just the work that she does in racial justice and housing just, like, it means so much to us, especially at Afghanistan. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you do. It's truly inspirational. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes, Leslie. I want to reiterate the thanks, but I, I also really loved hearing from the elected officials around integration and alignment. And I think I'll just throw this out there. You guys know what the policy is, but I think there's an opportunity and I know it's been talked about. I know it's in the early learning divisions, former uh, plan to integrate or incentivize space in public housing developments for uh, childcare, youth programming, wraparound services, um, if there's an opportunity, I think, in that integration to incentivize housing developers or developments um, wherever they occur to add that extra square footage um, and get something back for doing so. And it takes care of the transportation piece, too, because people can walk um, to the services that can be provided in those spaces. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. Sheila, have you got a response? Well, I think, you know, that does add complexity to a really complex process. So it is hard. It takes years to assemble the finances as it is. And, you know, uh, Rep. McLean knows how long it took to build the senior housing and the Cornelius Library, but it's well worth it when you can combine those really critical functions. Um, I just want to say it's been great to hear from all of you as state legislators and also um, appreciative of how much you recognize the crisis that we have in affordable housing. We're one of the, we have the highest housing deficit, I think, in the nation in Oregon. We've had a lot of people move in and a lot of people have been moved out of their homes by those people who have moved in. So when people wonder why we have homeless, it's really, it is a mass problem and it's a really huge one. It, it's going to take a lot of resources to ever begin to build our way out of the problems we have. But I did want to um, say that I hope you know, you've seen the same thing that all of us on this call have seen over the last couple of years, which is 
the resilience of our communities is really based in our communities and seeing the locally, um, the grassroots organizations, you know, um, Bienestar, SIPA, Centro, Adelante, Home Plate, you know, all the groups that are based in our communities. So, you know, I listened in on WEA and I, I hear you talk about a lot of uh, housing um, answers and developers, but just want to be sure that you focus on the local folks, because in terms of doing the really hard work of integrating and understanding the services and resources at the local level, there's no match for folks who live and work in their local communities. So thanks for supporting them. And, and um, I know a lot of them support you and we love working together. There's some hard work ahead <coughs> in the coming sessions. So thanks. Thank you, Sheila. Anyone else in the final couple of minutes that we've got here? All right. Um, just as a point of order, Wednesday, April 20th is our next quarterly gathering. If it's not in your calendar, you might want to put a placeholder there, 8.30 a.m. We, we meet the first month of each quarter on the third Wednesday of the month at 8.30. So um, I think each time we, we meet, you'll need to register separately for each of these meetings. That's a, a little change from the past. So um, you can get on the Thrive's mailing list by going on Van's website, clicking on join our mailing list or something to that effect and it'll give you a choice of joining Thrives, joining the Racial Equity Collaborative, joining Van's mailing list. So um, you can keep up to date in that regard. And Representative Neuron, a closing comment? Is your hand up for? I'm sorry, I thought of it right after you asked. And yeah, yeah. John. Please. Um, I've been working closely with the community of Newburgh throughout the last year, and um, it looks like their recall efforts have potentially failed. So I just wanted to flag for this community here that there are a lot of people in the Newburgh community and Newburgh, the, the school district is in Washington County as well. So we can lean in as a Washington County Thrives organization um, to reach out to those that are hurting in the community and, um, and reassure them that they have allies. Um, we don't know and we won't know until mid-February what the final vote count is, but um, at this time, the community is really anxious and I wanted to flag that for this community that I think cares about these issues and what that school district is facing right now. So just put, put it on your mat, on your radar, reach out to anybody you know, um, and really lean in as Washington County um, because they do touch both Clackamas and Washington County, um, but predominantly in Yamhill County, but uh, they'll need allies. Thanks. Thank you for that. All right, friends, good to see you all. Until next time, be well. Bye-bye.